Civil 20, India 2023, envisions a conception of civil society 2.0. In a world where individual, family, society, market, and state can understand their respective roles better and supplement each other rather than engaging in conflicts. This year, the C20 symbolizes the flame of hope, self-motivation, and selfless service. Amma is grateful to the Indian government for arranging such a high quality meeting. All the issues raised here are vitally important. This should go beyond a mere physical meeting and become a true meeting, a meeting of hearts and minds. This is the only way to awaken ourselves and others. This year, C20 working groups will focus on Integrated holistic health, mind, body and environment Sustainable and resilient communities, climate, environment and net zero targets Education and digital transformation Gender equality and disability technology security and transparency lifestyle for environment preservation and conservation of traditional arts crafts and culture human rights as human values revival of rivers and water management seva sense of service, philanthropy, and volunteerism. Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. Diversity, inclusion, and mutual respect. SDG 16 and promoting civic space. Delivering democracy through participatory governance. tradition of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the whole world is one family, is founded upon the inherent oneness of all of humankind. Yet, the collective strength of our global family has diminished due to many complex challenges. Gender equality and disability inclusion are human rights and essential for a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Social inclusion is vital for an individual's dignity, security, and opportunity to lead a better life. Yet, women are often marginalized, and persons with disabilities are systematically excluded. 
Shri Mata Amritanandamayi Devi, Chair of the C20, emphasizes the importance of unity in diversity and underscores fundamental human values such as solidarity and active civic engagement for inclusive societies. Inspired by this conviction, the C20 Working Group on Gender Equality and Disability will signpost how G20 members can address gender inequality and discrimination and identify ways to improve access to education, livelihood, health, safety, security, and basic resources for social and economic empowerment of persons across genders and disabilities. Building on this mission, and in close dialogue with civil society organizations from G20 countries, this working group will identify high-impact policy recommendations for implementation in key areas, including physical and mental health, economic empowerment and sustainable livelihoods, education and skill development, society and culture, safety and security, environment and disasters, disability inclusion, women and the environment, and addressing root causes of inequality by engaging men and boys. Our working group builds on recommendations of previous C20 deliberations, reinforcing the need to mainstream and institutionalize gender equity and inclusion in all G20 countries, across all sectors, for women and disabled persons. We look forward to joining hands as one global family to solve today's most pressing issues. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Policy Dialogue on Inclusive Education with Skill Development, Policies and Priorities. My humble salutation to the C20 Chair, Her Holiness Mata Amrita Anandamai Devi, for whom we call lovingly Amma. The Government of India and C20 Engagement Group, we thank you at the onset of today's discussion for your consistent support and guidance. On behalf of the C20 Gender Equality and Disability Working Group, I warmly welcome our distinguished guests, experts, civil society organizations, esteemed members of C20 Engagement Group, and our lovely audience from across the world Namaste, Namaskaram. Today's webinar aims to include voices of civil society organization and other stakeholders for reflecting on various challenges, key priorities, policy gaps, and adaptive policy recommendations for relevant participation, promotion, and retention of women and girls, as well as women with disability in education, vocational training, and professional careers, particularly in G20 countries. Before we initiate our event, I would like to put across some housekeeping instructions. To ensure accessibility, we request the speakers to slow down their speaking pace so that our dear sign interpreters can communicate the message to everyone on the call. For those who need the closed caption feature, kindly enable the captions from the Zoom meeting by pressing enable CC at the bottom of your Zoom meeting screen. For better audio effect, we request all the panelists to keep their microphone muted when not speaking. In case you forget, our backend support will help you to mute the mic. While speaking, please do remember to switch it on 
we will be anyways on the call to help you out. It will be helpful to keep your camera on while you're making your interventions. The audience and the participants are requested to also actively engage in the chat box and share their views and questions. Our chat moderators will take them and they will be answered during the Q&A sessions. The moderators will also post relevant messages and notifications during the event. Please keep a note. Now, in order to initiate our event, we would like all of you to join us. Let us invoke the presence of the divine with a prayer. I request our IT support to kindly play the prayer. Om Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Dhyayamo Dhavala Vakunthanavati Tejo Maina Ishtiki Snigdha Panga Vilokini Bhagavati Mantasmita Sri Mukhi Vatsalyam Brata Varshinim Sumadhura Sankirtana Lapini Syamangim Madhusikta Suktim Amrata Nandat Mekameshwari Om Amriteshwari Namaha to set the context of today's conversation, I would like to invite Ms. Nidhi Goel, who is the India co-coordinator of the Gender Equality and Disability Working Group under, G20, under C20. To briefly introduce Ms. Nidhi, she is the founder and executive director of the leading national award-winning nonprofit organization, Rising Flame pioneering work on leadership and rights of women, youth, and the persons with disability in India. She has been working on disability rights and gender justice for the past 12 years at the global, national, and grassroots levels through research, writing, training, policy influence, and art. As a disability, diversity, and inclusion specialist, she has advised, led, and steered numerous global and national organizations and initiatives, ranging from UN Women Global, Dutch Ministry Philanthropic Innov Initiatives, National Human Rights Commission India, Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, to name a few. She has led multi-stakeholder and cross-movement work influenced policy and systems, authored groundbreaking research and publications, all with the vision to foster inclusion of women and youth with disability within India and globally, across four continents and in over 20 countries. She is India's first female disabled stand-up comedian and uses humor to challenge notions around gender and disability. We are delighted to have you, Nidhiji, and over to you. I request the back-end uh, back host to relay the presentation. Thank you so much, Namita. Uh, just wanted to check quickly if I'm audible as well as visible. Yes, very much. Okay. And this first slide is up for you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, at this webinar uh, consultation of the sub-theme within the Gender Equality and Disability uh, Working Group. Next slide, please. Let me take you through the agenda very briefly. Uh, we will give you an introduction to the working group itself, so the Gender Equality and Disability Working Group the process that we have followed and the sub-themes that exist within this working group, the timeline, uh, and how can you participate within this working group 
Uh, we've, we've shared this at the inaugural. Uh, we try and share some of these opportunities and repeat them in each of our sub theme consultations as well, uh, particularly so that we can foster participation or, or enhance participation from civil society. Can we go to the third slide, please? I just want to request the sign interpreters to unmute themselves if at any point I go at a pace um, that is not suitable for them. Um, so the working group's objective is to ensure that civil society concerns and considerations related particularly to gender as well as disability are taken into account in G20 discussions and are translated into the leader's declarations and policies as policies um, to bring the commitments and implementations within each country context. Next slide, please. So what is the process and workflow of this working group, the Gender Equality and Disability Working Group? Um, we have ensured continuity and inclusivity around the past uh, processes that have happened, the last five years, the policy pacts, meetings with members, um, but really the flow of activities, if I can take you through those, setting up of the working group, particularly this one has happened in January, 2023. Um, and the group was determined based on the 1200 plus inputs that were received from the civil society organizations and actors within India and globally, as well as the data that we received from Indonesia um, and the handover was taken as the working group in December. Analysis of the past policy facts were done um, and to be very precise by, for five years and sub themes, process, structures, timelines um, were largely proposed based on those. Um, the identified sub themes then in January 2023 were mapped to other working groups through the G20 leaders priorities and the objectives that they have laid out as well as other engagement groups, the Sherpa tracks and finance tracks. So P20 is one of the official engagement groups of G20. There are a few more. And so we also mapped it to those. Um, we also then identified partners from the huge database of civil society organizations that we received directly through the Secretariat, uh, where all of you, many of you registered through the Indonesian database, as well as UN official list of CSOs, et cetera. We, have, we are now holding thematic meetings, uh, which are both online and in person. Um, this is happening over three months, February, March, April. And so we would really request you to keep a track as well as uh, submit Udaharan's best practices because we are also collecting those. And policy brief will then be drafted in the subsequent months leading up to the final summit in July. Uh, 2023. Next slide, please. The proposed sub-themes within this gender equality and disability working group based on the intersection of awareness, access, and opportunities, three really major components, are health, that's the first sub-theme, education and skill development, safety and security, social and cultural changes, economic empowerment, environment, engaging men and boys for gender equality, and finally, disability, inclusion, and rights. Next slide, please. So what is the sub-theme doing here? Education and skill development. You know, the, the, there is this fantastic working group and advisors who can tell you more, but just to give you a little context, that lack of education and skilling negatively impacts GDP and national growth rates, lifetime learnings of women and other indicators of development progress. According to the World Bank, to give you some quick numbers, um, the lack of educational opportunities uh, for girls to complete 12 years of education can cost the country between $15 trillion to $30 trillion um, in the form of loss, loss uh, of lifetime productivity and earnings. And we know that the cost of exclusion for persons with disabilities within similar opportunities 
can be as high as 7% of a country's GDP. So what are the priorities of the education and skill development sub theme within this working group? What are its priorities? To improve women and girls access to education, including STEM education, particularly in marginalized as well as rural settings, addressing social and cultural barriers, gender stereotypes and biases, both visible as well as invisible, and other challenges like poverty, uh, gender harassment uh, or gender-based harassment rather, uh, child marriage, impacts of COVID-19 and so on. Uh, enhancing access to skill development and vocational training and sustainable livelihood opportunities that are hindered due to discriminatory opportunities uh, or discriminatory environment around skill development, as well as lack of support in upgrading um, skills and lifelong learning. And this is both for women as well as persons with disabilities. And lastly, supporting digital learning and digital literacy, improving the access to technology and the skills to use it for proportionate representation of women and persons with disabilities in the digital economy and bridging the digital divide. These are really, really bold objectives. And with your support, we will be able to draft robust recommendations to take some of the work ahead. Next slide, please. What are the timelines uh, of the working group largely, but even within this theme? Um, by 20th February, we've drafted a concept note uh, across these themes for the working group. Um, we're going to be having a policy zero draft, policy brief zero draft ready by 15th March. Um, Feb, March, uh, April, May. So until May 31st, we'll be having discussions, webinars, consultations, leading to development of white papers. And then finally, June and July will be the finalization on the, of the policy brief based on your recommendations in the white paper. Um, yeah, and then the final policy brief, uh, including Udaharans that you would share with us. The next slide, please. How can you participate in our working group? For those of you uh, who, for whom this is the first meeting, we'll take you through this quickly again. Um, participate in online dialogues, discussions, policy uh, uh, consultations, uh, which would then feed into the development of the white paper. So like you're doing today, uh, two very important written submissions of policy recommendations that you can send us under each sub theme that could be then included in the white paper again. Third one is to provide examples of best practices for the Harans of CSOs, civil society organizations that can be replicated, scaled up, et cetera. Uh, and there you would also find on the screen a link to the Google form to fill and be a part uh, of the list for the gender equality and disability working group. I'll request my colleagues for accessibility to also paste the link within the chat box. Um, last slide, we really hope you have a fruitful discussion today. And if there were any questions, any support needed at any point, any reasonable accommodation needs that you feel are not met, please reach out to our team. You can directly ping Nemita ji here, Srinidhi ji also on the call and the entire group um, and the backend team as well. So thank you very much for listening in and we really hope you participate because it's important for us that civil society voices are included and amplified within the gender equality and disability working group so that our policies are representative and that the G20 commitments and leadership declaration reflects our realities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidhi, for setting this lucid and succinct uh, context for today's meeting. Uh, now we would move to our other speakers. We are honored to have with us one of the eminent voices of women in science in Brazil, Professor Marcia Cristina Bernandes Barbosa as our keynote speaker. To introduce Professor Marcia Barbosa, 
Professor Marcia is a Brazilian physicist and professor at the UFG, UFRGS. And throughout her career, she has sought to unlock the secrets of water anomalies, initially from a theoretical perspective, and then by focusing her insights on practical application for medicine and the life sciences. Since 1998, Professor Barbosa has actively worked on issues related to women in physics. She was appointed the chair of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics Working Group on Women in Physics. In 2008, she became vice president of the Union of Pure and Applied Physics and director of the Instituto de Fisica at UFRGS. For her activities on gender issues, she was awarded the 2009 Nicholson Medal by the American Physical Society, an active member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Professor Barbosa was awarded the 2013 L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award for Latin America. Her groundbreaking work in science and for women in science has been recognized on various platforms at national and global levels. I request and invite Professor Marcia to share her perspectives. Over to you, Professor Marcia. May I request the IT background to put her slides on screen? I'm going to start by making a confession. I do love science. And the reason why I do love science is because science has a method. And today, I'm going to share with you my private method to look science and to look the world. I call it the 4E method because it's based in four words which start with the letter E in English, but also works in Portuguese and in Spanish, and I hope works in any language. The first, next slide, please. The first word I'm going to share with you is evidence. Next slide, please. And when you look to the picture, you're going to see by evidence that in 1927, most preeminent conference in physics, we just have one single woman, Marie Curie, sitting in the front row. And by the way, these people love wearing black because all the, you know, all the clothes are black. But then we are going to tell you, Marcia, this is 1927. Next slide, please. In the also conference in 2011, I'm sh showing the two single women in the room. And again, you can see that they love wearing black. So we see that in physics, we have this huge problem of lack of presence of women. But don't feel that you are from other fields and you are better than the physicists. Next slide, please. Because when you look to the own fields, this graph is particularly from Brazil, but I challenge you to do the same in every country. And most countries will even be worse than Brazil. I'm pointing in blue the percentage of women and in red the percentage of men from graduate, undergraduate level, where in Brazil today we are half and half, half women, half men, and that's already a big win because in some places in the world this is not the case. But as you go up in the career, follow the blue line. Is it goes more Political, we call this political when you start to be appointed to the committees. You understand? It's not just technical, it's also political. As you go political, the percentage of women goes down. And when you get to be really political, like ministers, the numbers vanish. Okay, so this we call Caesar graph because its presence is universal. We found that at the International uh, Conference of Women in Physics, that that's reality in every single country, that we start with a number and the women absolutely vanish. 
So we have plenty of evidence that you have a huge problem in that science that we already start to flow numbers and you have a problem in every place of the decrease of percentage of women as you grow up in the community. Next slide, please. But why do we need to fix this? Okay, you're going to come with a democracy, the right of women to be whatever women want to be. But I'm bringing you another point of view, a physicist point of view, efficiency. You know, remember your class of thermodynamics, machines and efficiency of the machines, but also as a human beings, we are more efficient if you share the work. If you select the people for every job from 100% of the population. Next slide, please. And that's not me, a scientist saying, this is the biggest corporation saying, this is a graph in which they rank it, the 500 largest companies in the world. And they figure out that the companies which have more better balance of women, they gain more money. Yes, more better balance, more diversity means more money. And actually, this is also true in science. If you look to the 10 years PhD in the United States, you're going to figure out that uh, big change means that you have breakthrough innovations when you have diversity. So diversity is a key factor for democracy, for women rights, but also to make a more efficient place. But how do you get to get this diversity? Next slide, please. So my third E is equity. You have to build equity. And when I say this in many places, they say, whoa, Marcia, we have equality by law. Equality is already implemented. Next slide, please. And only to make sure you understand the distinction between equality and equity, this cartoon is showing that at the end of the day, when you have equality, you probably have one apple. But when you have equity, you get three apples. And building equity means that you have to implement compensatory measures. What they call compensatory measures, in many places they call affirmative action. But since I'm not uh, you know, a natural English speaker, for me, uh, you know, affirmative action makes no sense. But when he said compensatory measures, I'm saying what you have to do, you have to compensate when the society build up rules that favor men, favor high, you know, men coming for the top of the society, favor the man coming from the global north, when society design a career, design a world that favor this group, we have to implement compensatory measures, measures that compensate for the other groups that are not in the game. So when society tells that a woman with a kid has no, is not competitive for a job, we have to create the compensatory measures while we change the rule. The best world will be the world that looks to the individuals and all the individuals have the same chance, have, it, have the same possibility. But while we cannot build this world, we build the compensatory measures. Means building up policies. And that's a hard thing to do. Why this is a hard thing to do? And I come with the 4E. Next slide, please. Because this is only possible. This is only possible if you use as a fuel, as a way to design these compensatory measures, the way to design this new society, if you have empathy. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge because for the people that design, designed the society to favor the man coming from the high class, the man at the global north, the favors the man from the global north, it's very hard for those people that have privilege to realize that they got there because they have privilege and that they have to give up privilege. 
Next slide, please. And, and I'm not saying that because I'm saying that. There is a study that shows that over education, women that is in, 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 in designing this graph growing up, women gain empathy, but men go down in empathy. And the study started at the 18 year, years old. Imagine a 60 years old guy, almost zero empathy. So we need also as a challenge to create this new fuel, much better than, than gas, much better than any type of energy, this empathy. And for that, we have to use all tools, teaching, creating places where we discuss. Next slide, please. But particularly over the years, I develop a second tool. Each time I go to a conference in physics, in my own field, to talk about my water simulations, I offer a play. A play in which I show the story of a girl since she, desi the, she desired to be a scientist until she becomes a scientist. And he called us the inconvenient woman in English. And that's the, the play I do with a colleague. She's the girl, I am the other characters, next slide, please. The professor, the mother, the colleague, all the people that crossed her life, like each one of us women have these characters in our lives. And everything we show happened with me or with Carolina. And when you show to the man the type of challenge that we face, they feel the sympathy. So we need to nest the empathy because we have maybe the biggest challenge, next slide, please, to overcome. Sorry for being in Portuguese, but when, what I'm showing here is a study done in my university, which shows that half of professor, people that work and students already suffer from harassment. Here's moral harassment half. So we have also this big challenge of moral harassment every place. Next slide, please. And we also show that 10% of this community suffer from sexual harassment. So while you build the spas that allow women to become a professional, you have to solve this disease, this endemic that's harassment, because harassment is a power tool to remove women from the possibility to achieve power. Next slide, please. So I tried to convey that with these four words, evidence, efficient, equity, and empathy, that together we can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Marcia, for your insightful and powerful views, I would say, on one of the key priorities of C20, which is participation and promotion of women and girls in STEM education and profession. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is a science administrator and the brain behind various interventions related to women scientists in India. Dr. Sanjay Kumar Mishra, a warm welcome to you. To introduce Dr. Mishra, she is, he is the Senior Advisor at the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. He is looking after the human resource development, agri-biotech, and the promotion of women in biotech-related programs. From 2012 to 2021, he has served as an advisor at the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, where he designed and launched various programs in the area of promotion of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which we call STEM, and innovation among school students. Before joining DST, he has served, uh, he has served various academic positions, including professorship uh, in Shivnadar University, New Delhi, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and the Institute of Engineering and Technology at Lucknow in India. 
He pursued his doctoral research at the University of Oxford and a postdoctoral research at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation US. He is a recipient of various national and international recognitions and has been awarded for his academic excellence. He has 27 or more than 27 peer reviewed journal publication and a lot many conference papers and book chapters for his credit. We are delighted to have you, Dr. Mishra, and I request you to share your thoughts and perspective. Over to you. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, to the organizers and uh, particularly, to, particularly to the C20 Gender Equality and Disability Working Group, uh, led by Dr. Bhavani Rao and Ms. Nidhi Goel and Meg Jones for inviting me to this very, very important discussion forum. And uh, I'm also delighted to listen to the previous speakers and particularly to the uh, Marcia who, just, uh, who has just now given a very brief, very powerful and very, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. So, so already uh, the stage has been set about the broad contours, the policies and challenges uh, in the area of the, particularly the gender balance in education and also the persons with uh, special abilities in area of skill development and education both. Now at the outset, uh, I've got a couple of points, uh, uh, partly based on my previous experience in working in government and dealing and designing with their various programs, but also uh, based on the some of thoughts which many of you have already echoed. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things as a man, I, I, I must admit that as a man, when I took the charge of women in science, I myself have to learn several things that what are the really the challenges? Why women require special treatment? Okay, so and so forth. So I've gone through the literature and then I started looking the same scenario, same challenges from a different lens. And then uh, if, if I can confess that I myself has changed my own perception, my own personality in the last five, six years since I've been handling these programs. So first, if you look at the, um, if you look at the, uh, in general, uh, education field, education or skill development, that is a broad area. You'll find the data suggest, especially for a country, I think that's true for global and true for India also. If you go back to 20 years, the gender parity index or the enrollment of girls and boys, there were huge disparity. But in the last 15 years, uh, probably if you have seen that, at least in India, the gender parity index and the enrollment has gone up and I'm very happy and delighted uh, that the, the current, the last survey of higher education shows that it, the index is 1.01 or there are more girls or women who are enrolled into higher education sector uh, than men. It's, it's a very, uh, very nominal difference, but it's, a, uh, but, but it's a symbolic and also it's a great achievement, I, I, I personally feel, uh, because increasing enrollment in last 15, 20 years uh, has been a, a, a quite progress. Now, I'll come later on that despite these advancements, there are still the challenges. If you look the lens, look at the data, you'll find several disparities. But at the moment, yes, this is a good point that as far as the enrollment is concerned, we have come to a milestone. Then come to the second point that uh, we mentioned that why uh, <clears throat> the enrollment of girls or women or educational skill development is important. Now, I believe, I believe that it's, it's not only important from the uh, societal point of view, moral point of view, or it's a legal pre prerequisite, but it is healthy for any society to develop, it, develop in a sustainable manner. You cannot imagine that 50% of the population is lagging behind and uh, in, in any area, whether it is the economic development or education or skill development. So having said that, yes, for a sustainable development, we need to have uh, the women participation. 
but also recently i think uh, one of the speaker has already pointed out that previously there was a misconception that uh, <clears throat> to put more women into the education sector requires a lot of the investment and money or to have more women into the corporate sector or in the job profile uh, the recent data shows that it is it is much more beneficial for the company for any organization to improve the productivity if if your staff is more diverse already pointed out so the last point which i am trying to press is that that having more uh, diverse workforce whether it is men women uh, diversity of you know like uh, you know gender uh, diversity of the people from different origin different thinking always helps the any organization whether it is a government whether it is a you know corporate sector whether it is an ngo so that also gives my last point that it makes an economic sense it makes a business case to have a i'll say equality or equity equity i i, I also prefer equity is a better word than equality at my personal level in any organization so to achieve in workforce you the feeder mechanism is the education and skill development so if you look the larger picture the skill development and education is a tool is a means to achieve at higher level of the equity in workforce and what i call self at personal level that the equity uh, there are various forms of equity but i believe the most important for anyone whether it is men or women is the economic equity you have economic empowerment then a lot of other you know parameters will flow down from economic powerfulness and economic independence for women so so that gives you the larger picture in my opinion so education skill development and as 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 uh, rightly pointed out in the today's context the digital education or digital empowerment of women in today's context is very very important so everything is linked together once you achieve and then you get the economic independence and further economic independence economic power will emit other powers and we, and it becomes a virtual circle for anybody whether it is men or women both ways so for women it's important and we are on the right track now uh, the other point which i wish to make that uh, uh, i think it's true for global uh, data but for india it's very interesting that although i say that the gender parity index has improved the <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> the enrollment of women has increased is at par but when you dissect the data you will find that most of the women their enrollment is pretty much high into the several areas like life sciences health sciences you won't find those numbers in engineering <coughs> <coughs> sorry you won't find those numbers or high numbers in areas such as mathematics engineering and within engineering if you dissect the data you will find more women into the computer science and but not so much into mechanical engineering into civil engineering so the point i am trying to although the total average data shows progress but if you dissect you will find there are pockets where still women are underrepresented in certain profession in certain subjects nevertheless we have achieved the step number 1 and i am sure that in future we will have more uh, excuse me now <clears throat> i must say on record that this this was not possible because of government's intervention alone this progress in education and skill development which has occurred in last 15 years in india this is a cumulative effect of interventions policies of the government but more important <clears throat> the equal support given by the families the civil societies the social changes the employer the industry the private sector so all 360 degree all players of the ecosystem everybody has supported to achieve this one and that is the way forward also in my opinion uh, government policies it seems sanjay uh, mishra's uh, connectivity has some issues so uh oh. 
he is frozen, I believe. We wait for uh, 30 seconds if we, he could resume back or else we move to the next segment of the meeting. Maybe he's rejoining. Sorry, I think I was logged out. Oh, Hello. okay. Okay, we could hear you now. Okay, Dr. Sorry, Mishra. I see that. This is possible because, because of the support from all walks and all players of the game or the ecosystem providing all support. Uh, <clears throat> Now, another point, which is uh, because I can see the audience is from all disciplines. So I come from engineering and technology background. So uh, if you look at any technology, any technology which comes into the market, uh, if you look at last 100 years or even 200 years, in general, by default, uh, if not all, but majority of technology, they are designed pro-rich, they are pro-urban they are pro male, so the, the initial design comes, and it takes ages or years to make the technology equitable. Okay, so uh, whether it is the space technology, whether it is the automobile, so the point I am trying to say that there has been in the past there has been some conscious and unconscious biases in the society. I'll not name, but there has been uh, you know the biases. Now, the good news is that in last couple of years, at least in India, I can see with, with the support of all the, all the stakeholders, this thing is changing. Now, uh, like 15, 20 years back, if you look now, the number of women in India, especially going in the armed forces or in the fighter jets, you take or Navy or you name a profession, you'll find the women are going everywhere. And this is possible because of the policies has been designed Policies has been appropriately uh, pro uh, changed. And as the previous slide, what Maria suggested in equity, what we call the support mechanism. So the support mechanisms have been slowly evolving and that is the way forward for increasing the participation. Now, uh, I think uh, in my introduction, I was, you know, uh, I was given that, uh, you know, in my, in my work in DST and DBT, I have started a few, few programs, so I'll just very briefly in two minutes will try to summarize and then uh, then come to the the experience or the conclusion which I can which I have got from them. Now uh, the government of India's Ministry of Science and Technology have evolved several programs. So there is one program which is called Women in Science, uh, Women Scientist Scheme, where there is a scheme which is earmarked especially designed for those women who want to come back into academia or research after a gap of five or six or even 10 years, because it is very common for the women to have a PhD or a master's and then uh, take the care of the family, or they are not into the productive in the career profession for, for a few years into the job. So once they want to come back, then sometimes it becomes an unequal field that you have got another person who, is, who doesn't have any career break and you have second applicant who have a career break. So the government is designed a scheme, especially for those women scientists to come into the mainstream. We provide fellowships, scholarships, and we also provide mentors for three to five years. This scheme supports the women at all ages, till 55 years of age, women can come back into mainstream for a project-based uh, three to five years of the work experience. Similarly, we have got another scheme where uh, <clears throat> we provide infrastructure support to the various universities and colleges, which are women only. Again, because there are schemes uh, where you provide support to all the universities, but the women only universities, India has about, you know, about 10 universities and few colleges. So there are schemes which have been supervising. I initiated a AI component in those schemes. Now, interestingly, two programs which were designed recently, one of them uh, is Vigyan Jyoti scheme, uh, which has been designed primarily to attract the girl student at high school level into STEM career. Now, again, I would like to say that I am not against that any girl should have a choice to study of her choice, whether she studies music, sociology, political science, or mathematics, that is her choice. We should respect that. However, the literature and data shows that because of the lack of the peers and the lack of sometimes scholarships and lack of the transportation, even though the girl child wishes to study STEM subject, but she is unable to have. And that is, I call from my ministry perspective, lost women scientist within court because otherwise if, if if we would if we would have provided enabling environment that particular girl 
would have taken a stem subject made her career so my idea was to attract those girls back to the you know into the stem career so that scheme vigyan jyoti we have already introduced in 200 districts of india is running i think uh, roughly uh, maybe to about 20000 girls from the schools in about 200 districts are being taken care where we provide the first thing is a mentor coaching role model from the local district economic support coach and also some sort of a career progression career guidance to choose their career uh, at their own choice at their own talent now the, there is another another scheme or another program which i initiated i feel uh, i feel very proud of that is called gati this is gender advancement transforming institutions now uh, as a dst person i was having a portfolio of the women in science promotion of women in science now i thought this is this should not be the job of one person or one division or one ministry in government it is a it is a shared responsibility for each ministry each department at every level and therefore this gati is is based on the athena swan project of the uk where uh, we have about you know uh, several parameters matrix we evaluate and examine all the universities and research labs based on how good they are how supportive they are for the women workforce or women students or girl students so there is parameter which include the physical support system policy support system recruitment retention promotion so it's a it's a huge exhaustive exercise so it's a kind of a gender audit in very soft sense and then we rank the universities and and the colleges based on how good and not so good for women and that ranking will is not something to punish and reward but very often uh, when i was talking at personal level couple of the vice chancellors of large universities they admitted that it's a huge system they themselves were not aware of the gaps within their own system now this examination this evaluation gives them the gaps in their universities and and they try to have actions that these gaps are filled so this is another you know example which uh, which started at you know my time so all the examples uh, <clears throat> these are the actions which are taken by the government but as i said earlier unless the all the stakeholders whether it is universities employers students families they come forward uh, things won't move as we wish now i'm just moving to another point i think earlier also this point has been raised especially about the challenges if you look at the data of last 3 years during the covid the impact of covid i think it's 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 very very clear uh, globally it's, it's true for the i think european countries as well us i suppose and india also the job losses were everywhere but the women lost more jobs compared to the men during the covid even the recent data of the ashre government of india also shows that the the enrollment in colleges has reduced has come down for both men and women but in certain areas there were more losses more uh, what what you call um, uh, the lower enrollment among the women compared to the men so the and there is a study which suggests that in some areas like in commerce in some areas in some subjects the enrollment has come down to the pre covid level like whatever enrollment were there 2015 or 17 now this has come down so again still that shows that the challenges are still there whenever whenever there whenever there, there is an emergency and whenever there is a situation like covid it is the it is the women who lose their wages and enrollment so this thing still need to be reinforced and practices and policies need to be strengthened so that at least this gap is minimum uh, now looking forward looking forward to the uh, data as i said earlier uh, in my opinion there are uh, two or three challenges which i believe uh, there are number of points but i believe one or two areas where uh, where everyone needs to focus and and that be good if you can work and make changes number one i believe in last 15 20 years at least in india india the the enrollment or access to education has made a huge impact huge change that part still we can do a lot we can always argue that yes in mathematics we need to improve or there are some minor areas where we need to do but the real challenge i believe is moving the women from education sector or educated women into the workforce 
So this is the education box. This is the workforce box. And education is a kind of a feeder to the workforce. That is a greater challenge because if you look at the data uh, in STEM in, STEM enrollment, there are about 30% women who are enrolled into the STEM field at PhD level. At PhD level, okay. But the moment you go for a workforce level, the number dips to 16.6%. So full-time employed women in I think there's an issue with uh, Dr. Mishra's uh, connection. And he. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, the second yeah. challenge or second issue, I believe, is okay. Uh, you'll find X number at initial entry position scientist C or assistant professor. But as you move from assistant professor to full professor, dean, vice chancellor level, that is where the number dips. And it's a challenge to not only to attract, but to retain women into the workforce and also to have the career progression at the highest level. That is the second, I will say, focus point. Is, is And last point is that, although not only for women, but we were talking about the disability as well. Now that is another section that among women, if you go have, uh, if, if, if you talk about the disability, then probably we still, we require much more attention and much more support mechanism in policies, both at institutional level, at government level, at industry level, to make sure that the equity is given to this particular class as well. So I think these are my observations, of course, Mine is based upon my own experience, particularly in the science domain, may or may not be extrapolated to all areas in all countries. So that's a disclaimer from my side, but I believe that is the way forward. And uh, as, uh, as Ortley, uh, I would like to re-emphasize and reiterate that the gender and disability is given adequate attention in this uh, uh, civil 20 and G20 process, because all of us are sitting here under the G20 agenda and that also proves that, <clears throat> that this particular issue is so important and for the G20 countries. And we recognize and acknowledge the dire need to bring people from marginalized groups into the social, political, and economic walks of life. A way forward to women-led development is to help them to realize their full potential and contribute to the growth and development of our society. Without this, I think we cannot claim to be developed and to move ahead in a manner what the uh, the uh, you know preambles of the any constitution of the India or constitution of the country or the UN preamble envisages. So that's very important, and all of us have to work together to achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mishra, for encapsulating various dimensions and plausible pathways relevant to mainstream equity and inclusion in education and skill development. Thank you so much for your interventions. Uh, before hopping into the next session, we come to the end of the introductory session and uh, we would request everyone to kindly switch on your cameras. We will be doing a quick group photo session so that we could capture these memories. So uh, I would request our pro screenshot takers who would be taking the photographs to kindly capture this momentous occasion. It'll take a minute. And please, please, please don't forget to put that brimming and beautiful smile on your face. While the photographers are taking pictures, I'll quickly brief through the next segment, that is the breakout room discussion. We will be moving into two different breakout sessions, namely education and skill development for sharing your thoughts on challenges, policy gaps, and suggestions based on key priorities for each breakout. Uh, we have listed a lot of key priorities in the agenda document, but if you have missed it, you will be briefed about it in the breakout rooms. For steering the breakout discussion in room one, that is education, we have Ms. Ella Yon Esko, who has joined from Turkey, 
as the chair of the room and Ms. Sarah Straub from Australia, who would be moderating the session. The second room is skill development, which is chaired by Dr. Midha Sumaya and moderated by Ms. Gayatri Manikutti. The flow of the discussions will be shared in the respective breakout room and other details will also be added. So kindly move to the rooms. We thank some of the participants who have indicated the preferred breakout rooms. I request others to follow the instructions on the screen and opt to move to their preferred breakout rooms. If you find any difficulty, please drop a text or raise your hand and our IT back, back ground support would help you. The time slot for breakout discussion is approximately 90 minutes and we'll come back to the main room after that. Thank you once again for your patience. See you in the breakout rooms. Okay. So very warm welcome um, to the breakout session here. We are still waiting for some members to join, but um, we, we will start shortly. Very good. So um, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, Thank 
Excuse me, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, like so on the bottom of the uh, Zoom meeting, you will get a window breakout session, breakout yes. room. Yes. So just click that. You will get an pop-up window. Yeah. In that, uh, you can select the education. It's education you want to go, right? Yes. Um, so on the education, you click and join and plus S. Hello, uh, those who are still in the main room, uh, they can join in each of the breakout room. Uh, in the bottom of the Zoom meeting, there is a logo breakout room. You can click it and join uh, uh, both the, uh, either in one of the meeting.
So I believe the, hello everyone, welcome back. I believe uh, 
the breakout sessions have come to an end. But it's only us at this point, right? I don't, I, is the other group as well joining us now or I don't see them yet? Yeah, so we'll wait for another one minute or so. Okay. Thank you for your patience. And uh, where we have dropped a message, most likely they would be also wrapping up in a minute or so. I was sitting in the education group and I must say that it was a very interesting, diverse, engaging discussion from all the speakers. There was so much to learn. And I think <laughs> we need to circle back and <laughs> reflect on our key priorities. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, yes. And a lot of um, quite a lot of synergies and and uh, common, let's say, um, ideas and recommendations. So yeah, I right. think it's it, it's a lot to reflect on. But as we said um, at the beginning, all of this are going to be incorporated in the white paper. So yes. nothing gets lost. Um, so all will True. be integrated um, into a final document. Now this this makes me believe that at one point we were thinking what would go in and there's so much of <laughs> exactly. ideas to do that. And now I'm thinking like, wow, there are so many people reaching out to us to help us to build mm -hmm. the documents. So this is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but yes, that means more work on our table. So allow me the GN all. I mean, we, we all had to sit together at some point. Yeah, and yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A beautiful yeah. comment from Maya. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Maya G. This is Thank great. You. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just waiting for me to also to join back so that we could start the concluding session. Apologies for the delay. I think the discussion is about to wrap up. So people have started coming in. So just a minute. Thank you for your patience. Here we are with the skill development break, breakout room people. <laughs> we were just waiting for all of you. Thank you for rejoining. And uh, I must say welcome back to everyone. Hope you had a stimulating and enriching discussion during the breakout sessions. I was a part of education and it was thrilling. And I'm pretty sure you had a good time in the skill development breakout too. Uh, we apologize that due to paucity of time, we were not able to do justice to each speaker. I know you had more to speak, but we really respect that you kept the timeline and managed to provide us some insightful interventions. However, we request our uh, participants to kindly share your policy suggestions in written format and also the best practices, the Udharans, using the template. I would request the chat moderators to kindly repost the links to download the templates for policy suggestions, as well as the best practices. 
we will be also circulating the WhatsApp group link to continue our engagements beyond this event. So yes, to take forward the concluding sessions, we would be doing the summary of the breakout room discussions, uh, which will be done by our uh, rapporteurs. To begin with, I invite Dr. Christopher Coley from Amrita University to present the summary point for education. Over to you, Christopher. Thank you so much, Nimita. Um, I will be utilizing the whiteboard function here in the Zoom call uh, to share the notes that um, all of us note takers took during the excellent presentations from our CSO partners. So just one moment, I will open this board now. Hopefully you can start to see it. it seems like it's loading. So while it's loading, I will just summarize that uh, we began the discussion with highlighting the four key priority areas that were predefined um, within the education sector. These four include improving women and girls access to education, especially STEM fields, and especially in marginalized and rural settings. Second, addressing socio-cultural barriers, gender stereotypes and biases, and other structural bottlenecks to accessing and completing education. Um, I would just recommend that, that all of the viewers of the whiteboard uh, refrain from editing the document during this presentation and, and we can work on it collectively later. The third would be supporting digital learning and literacy and improving access to digital technology, therefore representation, um, uh, increasing representation in the digital economy. And finally, ensuring a continuum approach from education to skill building and employment. I am not able to see the whiteboard on our shared screen here. So um, please forgive me, I will just talk through these issues uh, and we can try to share a screenshot of this whiteboard post meeting. So within that first uh, priority area, which is improving women and girls access to education in the STEM fields, it was recommended that we invest in and empower and train our teachers as well as parents in gender issues, in community development, and digital technologies, and how these can be translated into more engaging classrooms. And this is especially important for teachers working in isolated and marginalized communities, especially rural populations. It is also an effective way that we can engage men and boys in improving the education sector overall. Second under this uh, thematic area is reflecting on and improving classroom structures to reduce obstacles for students with disabilities and to be more comfortable for women's specific health and to encourage participation from other marginalized groups. Within the thematic area of addressing social cultural barriers, it was recommended that we, um, for those women who are trying to re-enter STEM careers following a gap because of family or other responsibilities, that we improve training programs that target women who have taken such a career break, as well as institutional and infrastructural supports for these women to transition more seamlessly from a domestic life to, again, a career life. Secondly, introducing extracurricular programs and technical classes for girls in STEM fields to remove any taboo or improve confidence of girls to develop aspirational goals within STEM careers. This is also an effective way for working with dropouts or potentially vulnerable students. Under the the theme of supporting digital learning, literacy, and improving access to digital technologies, it was recommended that we improve our data-driven evaluations of existing digital platforms and online training and education systems, especially for marginalized groups and women in their own communities. Secondly, to include extended training and education for lifelong learning, including digital and financial literacy for entrepreneurship training. And finally, within ensuring a continuum approach from education to skill building and employment, the following recommendations came up, including digital and online education as an effective tool for bringing international quality education to all corners of a country, especially rural communities who are otherwise isolated. Secondly, to invest in women and girls continued skilling um, because women's empowerment directly improves education across a community 
In addition to women, um, in addition, women's groups can support each other to progress in their own careers. And then and very finally, we had two general points that came up repeatedly. One is that context specific approaches are required that are based on levels of isolation, poverty, and other social cultural norms of a community, that these need to be invoked to ensure that any interventions are the most relevant for the target populations. Secondly, education institutions must create an ecosystem that supports increased education from a more holistic perspective. This includes from uh, supporting mothers during pregnancy to humanistic teacher training and through development of children within schools and outside the classroom. And this includes engaging the family and the wider community. So that's it from the educational breakout sector. Again, I believe we'll be promoting these templates for submitting written documentation for policy recommendations and best practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher, for your uh, effort to put across all those points. I know it's it was a Herculean task while the discussions were going on. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm sure we would be refining all these points after listening to the recordings. I may now invite Dr. Srividya from Amrita University to present the summary points for skill development. Over to you, Shrividya. Okay, sorry, it took me a while to unmute myself. <laughs> so um, the discussions in the skill development breakout group were a bit more organic. Um, I'll try my best to capture what was uh, spoken here. Um, our moderator, Dr. Medaji, she really set the tone for the discussion. Um, she called for solution-driven adaptive uh, policy recommendations to promote inclusive skill development, keeping in mind uh, yes, the we ultimate- We go a little slower, sorry. Sure, Thank sure, so sure, much. sure. No problem, no problem, yeah. So Medaji called for adaptive, uh, solution-driven policy recommendations um, to promote inclusive skill development, um, keeping in mind the ultimate goal um, or aim to strengthen livelihoods. Um, she also emphasized the need for policies that support um, and strengthen the skill ecosystem nationally and internationally, um, um, calling for exchange of skill, skill resources across the G20 countries. Um, and um, I think the the in terms of the overall again with the overall tone of of of, of the conversation, Nidaji also made a very strong recommendation for applying gender mainstreaming towards the design, implementation, uh, monitoring, and evaluation of skill development programs. And so that I think um, really uh, set the tone for our conversation. And like I said, it was a very organic discussion, um, but I tried to distill maybe three. Uh, overarching buckets in which uh, policies and um, interventions were were made. Um, one is in terms of mechanisms to strengthen the access and inclusion of women and disabled persons in skill development. The other is around interventions and policies to support the transition from skill development to labor force participation. And uh, the third is around strengthening the quality and sustainability of skill development. Um, and so with these, I'll just try to flesh out some of the recommendations that were made. Um, in, with respect to the mechanisms to strengthen the access and inclusion, one cent central challenge that was emphasized by several speakers was the lack of data specific to skill development. Um, and <clears throat> and the need for and, and the need for that. So so uh, mechanisms to to provide um, better access to information um, and disaggregated information. Um, the other is um, related to that. It was around um, the limiting nature of our definitions of skill development um, and the call for expanding our current definitions to include entrepreneurship as well. Um, another recommendation around um, this area was. Um, for a center for excellence uh, for skill development, um, specifically um, bringing to attention participation of women and disabled persons should be in areas of, you know, should be in positions of leadership um, with respect to uh, uh, to these centers. Um, and then um, lastly, within this, within this bucket around mechanisms for strengthening access and inclusion um, was the mention of needing to address the gender digital divide. 
um, particularly in rural India, um, which has had direct impact on, which has direct impact on skill development and labor force participation. Um, so specifically, a policy recommendation was made to enable free and regulated uh, digital access, being mindful of online safety, of course. Um, but this would in turn help lessen other, you know, very pressing issues around gender-based violence and just improve overall equity and growth. Um, so the next around transition, the, the theme of transitions from skill development to labor force participation. Um, as we all you know, may well know, there's a huge issue in uh, women's participation, particularly following their maternity leaves. And so a recommendation was made for policies to be designed around uh, the life cycle of women, the life cycle of mothers, but not just women and mothers, but life cycle of individuals. So to make those policies very specific to the life cycle of, of individuals, um, to be able to address uh, address um, the their inclusion or the lack of inclusion following, um, following maternity leave. Um, policies and programs um, to address the provision of childcare was another recommendation um, that was made. Uh, you know, Childcare is shown to be very critical to women's participation in the workforce, as many of us know. And um, <laughs> good care has the potential to create inclusive and gender transforming societies and towards that end the recommendation for policies that recognize the uh, immense potential that care work offers in the way of decent work was um, a recommendation that was made um, and then also in terms of um, you know mechanisms to strengthen the transition from skill development uh, to uh, participation in the workforce was the recommendation for community-based incubators to support women's entrepreneurship or women's self-employment. Um, and then so the last the last sort of chunk of, of recommendations that came out were themed under under the area of strengthening the quality and sustainability of uh, skill development. Um, one recommendation was um, you know to promote in the integration of holistic education into you know, standard uh, curriculum, um, vocational education curriculum, but I guess also in education curriculum, um, incorporating human skills, uh, technical and non-technical, um, uh, you know, portions into into the curriculum in order to um, address uh, address a more holistic um, approach, um, and then towards the sustainability of skill development, a recommendation was made to uh, try to address issues around climate change by promoting. Uh, recycling and upcycling practices across industries, um, across sectors from uh, agri-based agri indus industries to the textiles, um, which also represent huge opportunities for employment and in innovation, um, if we were to do that. Um, a recommendation was made for, uh, you know, there ways to incentivize or promote private investment in skill development um, to address lags in offering demand-driven skill development, which seems to be one of the greatest impediments challenging existing skill development programs. Um, there was um, also recommendation for governments to then instead focus on financing um, through interventions like skill vouchers. Um, and then lastly, um, in this area, uh, on-the-job training and apprenticeship um, uh, approach, you know, on the job and apprenticeship, uh, you know, being very, very critical to uh, the development of, of skills is something that is apparently being practiced, uh, you know, widely, but not necessarily uh, so effectively in India. And so that was an area that um, was also brought to the attention to also address um, uh, the promotion of entrepreneurship as well. Um, and then lastly, not necessarily within like these three buckets, um, just that skill development um, has had a very sort of bad rap. It is often sort of considered the, the stepchild or the, <laughs> the unwanted um, sort of stream of education. And, and although, although interventions like uh, national education policy have, you know, helped to sort of uh, redress this, uh, there's a lot of lack of awareness around the policy itself and a lot of backlash against the policy itself. This is something that was brought up by one of the speakers. And so there's definitely a need to try and um, enhance and continue to enhance the aspiration for skill development, promoting um, and sharing, highlighting stories of success and benefits around um, skill development. So um, this was the general gist of, of, <laughs> of the conversation. Of course, much more was said, and I, I, I tried to try to capture it all. but. Um, we're looking forward to those recommendations, those written recommendations to really get all those details, but um, this is it. Thank you so much, Shrividya, for 
kind of capturing the whole essence of the skill development. I know <laughs> it is a lot more than what we have been speaking, but thank you for making the presentation. Uh, this has been a very engaging discussion, and I think it is just the beginning of uh, what we wanted to discuss under the education and skill development sub theme uh, for the working group on gender equality and disability. So uh, with further ado, I would request everyone to switch on the camera for another photo session because many colleagues have joined quite late in the discussion and we don't want to miss their smiling face in the group photos. Please hold on to that smile for two minutes while others on the call who are our exceptional e-photographers would take those snapshots. And while our photography session is going on, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. Shashikant Shankar from Amchi Lab, Amrita University, to give the word of thanks. Over to you, Shashi. Thank you very much, Nimita. Uh, it is my pleasure to do the vote of thanks. So I would like to extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude to everyone who made the webinar a grand success. So firstly, I would like to thank the JD Working Group coordinators, Dr. Bhavani Rao, Meg Jones, and Nidhi Goel for their hard work and dedication in bringing this webinar to reality. Your efforts have contributed immensely to the success of the, of the event. Next, I would like to express my gratitude to the advisory group members, Meda Sumaya Ma'am, Eli Nishku, and Meda Khadekar for the invaluable guidance and support in the planning and execution of the webinar. A special thank uh, goes out to our main speakers, two main speakers, Dr. Marcia Barbosa from Brazil and Dr. Sanjay Kumar uh, from India, Government of India, for their insightful and thought-provoking ideas. I would also like to extend a special thank you to all the individual speakers, experts, and representatives of CSOs, as well as partner institutions who shared their respective thoughts in the education and the skill development breakout rooms. Your valuable insights and perspectives have added depth and richness to our discussions, and we are excited to see your active participation in this critical dialogue. We are grateful for your willingness to share your expertise and experiences and for the contributing to a fruitful and engaging discussion. So now moving forward, our team would love to continue this discussion and move towards developing udaharans, policy recommendations, and white papers. We look forward to receiving uh, submissions from all of you. The templates have been circulated and also posted on chats. And in case if you do not have uh, the links or you need some any external information, please write us. We invite all the participants to join hands with us in this endeavor and we encourage CSOs to come forward and partner with us to organize side events under the banner of C20 and G20. I would also like to thank our sign language interpreters coordinated by Ms. Srinidhi from Rising Flame for making the event accessible to everyone. Your skills were critical in ensuring that all attendees could fully participate and engage with the content. A big thank you goes out to team that work behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of the webinar. This includes our moderators, Dr. Nimita Pandey, Sarah Straw, and Gatri Manipote, note-taking members and coordinators, chat moderators, and our photographers. Lastly, I would like to thank the backbone team of IT who made this event possible in this format. Your hard work and dedication are deeply appreciated. Once again, thank you to everyone who contributed to the success of this webinar. Your support has allowed us to have a meaningful discussion on education and skill development from the lens of gender equality and disabilities. We will continue our engagements through various activities, side events, and discussions to bring the voices of CSOs in C20 and G20 process. Thanks again to all of you. Now we close the session and looking forward to future collaborations. Thank you and have a good night, a good morning, good afternoon, based on your locations. Thank you. <laughs>